Hello everyone, has any of you found themselves on a desert island with uh, like a radioactive isotope and an X-ray spectrometer and had the uh, impelling desire to know if your ring that you bought at the local market is really made out of silver or, or maybe they just scammed you? Or maybe you just wanted to be able uh, to hunt for radioactive rocks in the forest? Well, after watching this video you will be able to do so. First of all, let's talk about uh, the X-ray spectrometer side. As you know, high energy photons come in two flavors, X-rays and uh, gamma rays. Gamma rays are much higher in energy and they penetrate deeper into stuff. While X-rays are used to see through you, for example, and uh, are more interactive uh, with uh, the normal matter around us. There are mainly two types of uh, low energy detectors that are enriched for the amateur and they are a uh, silicon pin photodiode and this is a commercial one that uh, can uh, reach very high resolution compared to its size unfortunately it can be very expensive so in this video we are interested in uh, building another type of this uh, detector which is uh, an X-ray spectrometer based on a photomultiplier tube and a scintillating compound which is uh, way cooler and it's, it's also less expensive and more instructive. A phototube is a device that transforms light into an electric signal and can be uh, sensitive to very low amount of light. It uses a photocathode that uh, creates electron via the photoelectric effect that uh, then are amplified by a series of dynodes using secondary electron emission. So a scintillating crystal is a type of material that is capable of converting an incoming X-ray or gamma rays photon into a certain number of visible light photons. The scintillating material contains uh, dopants which uh, can shift their emission wavelength and uh, change, for example, the response time. The emission wavelength is very important because uh, by tuning that uh, we can achieve a higher efficiency uh, that's because our phototube is sensitive to a narrow range of light. So it is then intuitive that if the incoming ray is totally stopped inside of the scintillating compound and its energy is totally absorbed, uh, the more energy the gamma ray has, the more secondary rays it can produce. And so there will be more light uh, created in the scintillator. In this way it is possible to connect uh, the energy of the gamma photon to a measurable quantity, which is the amount of uh, visible light that is produced. This allows us to collect a large number of data, which can be then used to build a spectrum, in which there is uh, the number of photons on the y-axis, and uh, on the x-axis, uh, the energy of the, each photon incoming. This spectrum is very useful, because every radioactive material has a specific one, uh, like a digital uh, footprint. So it is possible to identify the radioactive substance based on it. Another, in some ways, similar application that I will show you is the so-called X-ray fluorescence, which consists in the emission of a characteristic X-ray fingerprint from a substance when it is bombarded with a high enough energy radiation. And we'll talk about that later. First of all, we need a photomultiplier tube. This one is uh, the one I'm using and uh, it's an Hamamatsu 980. It has a high impedance voltage divider um, totaling to 120 mega ohm. The photomultiplier tube needs uh, to be inside an enclosure and uh, in this case I'm using a metal can to which I made two holes, one for the incoming X-ray and one for the cable output. If we want to see very low X-rays, it is fundamental to use an extremely transparent windows to the energy that we are interested in. And for this reason I'm gonna use aluminum tape. Choice of the crystal is another important topic. So I choose a material with a thickness range of about 1mm. 
but it also has to be thick enough to completely stop x-rays and uh, I'm interested in the region between 1 and 100 kilo electron volt. This is the disc of cesium iodine that I'm going to use. It's a uh, salt, so when it will be irradiated, it will emit green light. Cesium iodide crystal topped with thallium under X ray. And uh, in this video, you can see me irradiating. Uh, this particular uh, scintillating compound with my homemade x-ray machine and you can see the emitted light so the light did pass through the crystal and uh, into the photomultiplier tube without being for example absorbed or scattered so it is really important to have a clear uh, interface between the two material and uh, for uh, this purpose there are uh, some uh, usually expensive compound that has very similar refractive index uh, between glass and this uh, material but I found uh, another equally good solution that is uh, this uh, particular type of uh, silicon grease which is used inside the coffee machine and uh, it is food grade so it's uh, really pure and uh, it works really great for this job we need to apply uh, the grease to the face of the photomultiplier tube and then press the crystal strongly onto the face so that uh, uh, the grease expands and uh, gets out from the side this process ensures us to get uh, the highest uh, max possible uh, resolution from the final spectrum another important aspect to achieve high resolution is to never use a crystal that is larger than the face of the photomultiplier tube so in this case uh, you can clearly see that the diameter of the crystal is smaller than the diameter of the optical face of the photomultiplier here you can see me putting uh, some teflon tape around the crystal and uh, on top of the face of the photomultiplier tube. This is done because uh, in our region of emission, which is green light, Teflon is a really good reflector, and so the light uh, that uh, is emitted inside of the crystal that is going away from the face of the photomultiplier tube will be reflected back and uh, will enter the photomultiplier tube anyway without uh, escaping and uh, making us lose uh, the information of, about the rays. After uh, the teflon tape you can see me putting uh, aluminum foil around the tube and this is done so that no light will enter the tube uh, from the sides and in general to reduce the risk of uh, the tube being damaged from light uh, uh, that uh, may enter the container by accident. Be careful because the high voltage terminal here are uh, between 700 and uh, 1200 volts so they need to be properly insulated from the ground. The next layer is called the mu metal and this is a high magnetic permeability alloy that uh, protects the electronics from the outside mag magnetic field. You might think that it is, this is not a big deal but even the earth magnetic field might have an influence on measurements and uh, if we put for example a magnet near the tube while it's running the output of it will go to zero this metal works by absorbing the magnetic field line and uh, prevents them from uh, going through and that's because uh, it is uh, like a sponge for a magnetic field now the detector is almost complete I'm putting a line of paper just uh, to avoid it from going around too much. In the meantime, I have also crafted the BNC connector, screwing it to the lid and ensuring that uh, it is well grounded. I'm also putting uh, aluminum tape to prevent light from entering the holes from the screw. After soldering uh, the electrical connection together and the lead to the body so that all the metal parts are grounded, the probe is done. The electronics needed to record the spectrum are inside this yellow box. 
They have been designed by the Theramino group. It is an open source project, so you can find schematic about it online and uh, you can uh, build it yourself. So this is the inside of the circuit. You can see on the left uh, the PNC connector with the high voltage positive uh, on the inside and then uh, the RC filter for rectifying uh, the high voltage generator. This part instead it is the signal decoupling which uh, uh, takes out the pulses that come on the high, high voltage line and uh, transmit them to the signal processing unit here which uh, transform the pulses by integrating them and uh, they are converted into a signal which is then transferred to the PC via this uh, USB cable uh, through a normal audio signal that the sound card of your computer can read. Here on the right instead you can see the voltage divider for measurement and stabilization purpose and the high voltage generation circuit which uses uh, a high frequency inductor that is oscillating and uh, this uh, potentiometer allows uh, to regulate the high voltage coming out of the RC filters. Down here you can see the full bridge rectifier for the high voltage. So now that our probe is done we need uh, one last thing uh, to be able and use it. Well first of all a computer with the Thermino program running which is the multi-channel analyzer but uh, we need also a radioactive source uh, to calibrate it and uh, this time because we are interested in the low energy spectrum I'm gonna use uh, this americium button which comes from a smoke detector so what you see here is the pulse uh, coming from the photomultiplier tube that has been decoupled from the high voltage line you can see it's really short cesium iodide doped with thallium has a decay constant of about 1.5 microsecond so this pulse is too short to be used in our computer and so integrated using the electronics inside the yellow box and uh, this is the final pulse that the uh, sound card of a normal computer with a sampling rate of uh, 40 kHz can easily read. The sound card records the height of each pulse and then plots it on the x-axis, while on the y-axis there's the number of pulses with the same height. Now you're hearing uh, the radioactive uh, photons interacting uh, with the crystal and uh, you can also see when I put it closer to the detector what happens. Now you can hear uh, the difference between low energy gamma rays and higher energy coming uh, from uh, uranium. For example this is a pitch blender sample. You can hear that uh, there are fewer pulses but uh, stronger in volume. With our setup now complete, we are able to study the elemental composition using characteristic X-rays. When a high energy ray ejects an electron from an inner shell, the outer electron falls at a lower energy level, releasing X-rays that are characteristic of the element. This also happens, as you can see here, when a high energy electron ejected the inner one. To bombard the sample with X-rays, I'm gonna use this americium capsule. I made this source, it is uh, simply 6 americium capsule arranged uh, in a circular pattern that uh, shoot the X-rays towards the sample and the characteristic X-rays emitted by it then uh, comes uh, through the hole in the middle and uh, goes uh, to the detector. It is easier this way than uh, for example using an X-ray tube because uh, it doesn't need to be powered. One of the problem of this configuration is that uh, the emitted ray from the source gets also into the detector, but uh, the easier solution is to subtract uh, the background from the spectrum that we get instead of uh, building a setup like this with a LED screen to block uh, the rays coming from the source because this uh, reduces uh, to match the counter it because of the added thickness of the lead itself uh, between the source uh, and the detector. Here you can see the XRF spectrum of silver with in grey the background uh, coming from the source and in green uh, the measurement. By subtracting the background we can clearly see that uh, the peak uh, corresponded to the K transition of silver. Here we can see the spectrum of copper coming from a simple piece of tube 
we don't even need to subtract uh, the background because uh, the line of copper is far away from the excitation source and so it's pretty high in resolution and it's clear. If we compare this uh, with brass we can see the wider peak due to the presence of uh, zinc transition which are uh, around 1 kilo electron volt higher in energy that makes the peak uh, wider. And here you can see some other metal like lead, iron from a hammer and also a nickel strip. But uh, the more interesting one is the following. So I've been using this soldering uh, compound for a bit now and I always thought that it is uh, simply a mixture of tin, probably on the order of 90% and some other stuff like lead and uh, flux. But after taking an RxF spectroscopy, uh, you can clearly see that uh, there are two intense peaks. And one is the one from uh, tin, which is at uh, 25, uh, 28 uh, kilo electron volt. And the other one at uh, 12, we have already seen just uh, before, it's uh, coming from lead. In particular, they come from the L alpha and L beta transition of lead, which uh, normally we couldn't see in uh, other metal be because they are too low in energy, but uh, being lead of such a high atomic number, they are visible. So this time, uh, this machine has been useful uh, for a real application because uh, otherwise, I don't know how much time I would have needed to notice that I was using uh, lead uh, soldering. Now we're gonna briefly see radiation scattering in particular. On the left you can see relate scattering or uh, elastic scattering. That happens when a photon interacts uh, with an electron and doesn't lose his energy. Well, in Compton scattering, the incoming photon changes direction of travel and in the process it loses energy to the electron, so the energy lost is proportional to the change in trajectory. And so our energy spectrum will have two components, one of the incident rate that elastically scattered and the other one from the Compton scattered ray that will be lower in energy because it has donated some of its energy to an atom inside of the target. These graphs are the backscattered spectrum of the same material which is this metal file I had laying around. The brown line is the maximum recorded Compton shift that is around 12 kiloelectron volt from the main peak at 60 kiloelectron volt, while the other colored peak have been achieved by changing the geometrical parameter. The experimental data fit well with the theoretical one because uh, as you can see from this uh, graph of the possible Compton shift versus the angle, you can see that uh, the maximum achievable Compton shift uh, is uh, almost exactly the same I have achieved uh, between the gray peak which is the background radiation from the excitation source and uh, the brown one which is the maximum Compton shift. These two are other examples of Compton scattering with lighter elements. On the bottom there is the high density polyethylene, while on the right you can see an aluminum sample. You can clearly see the excitation peak and on the left the Compton scattering peak. This is a really interesting subject because by analyzing the Compton peak and the Rayleigh scattering it is possible to determine a lot of properties of the material like uh, its density or uh, the effective atomic mass. But unfortunately our setup is not yet good enough for that. So see you next time.